then officially a warm welcome to today's Women Energize Women's event on the topic of women empowerment in the energy sector, best practices worldwide. My name is Geraldine DeBastian and I am very excited for this upcoming session as we truly have perspectives from female leaders in the energy sector from across the world for you. This event is part of the Women Energize Women communication initiative of the Federal Ministry of Economic Affairs and Climate Action and implemented by the Deutsche Gesellschaft für Internationale Zusammenarbeit and the German Renewable Energy Federation in the scope of the ministry's global project Bilateral Energy Partnerships and Dialogues. This campaign really aims to empower, motivate, inspire, inform and inspire women show different role models of females working in the energy sector and to create a network and a knowledge base that we can all grow and learn from. And that is why it's so fantastic that we have so many fun yeah, wonderful women who are part of speakers of this session today. The focus of our session today will be on gender mainstreaming and the question which different approaches to women empowerment exist worldwide and how could they complement each other? Very quick word on the format. Our format is such that we're going to start with some welcome addresses um, by the hosts of our Women Energize Women campaign and today's session. Then we're going to engage in discussion with our valued panelists who I'll be introducing to you shortly. And then we'll be hearing some closing remarks from Christine Lentz at the end of the session. As I mentioned, we are very much looking forward to your questions, comments and interventions and we'll have the chat open for you throughout the event. Also, should you require any technical support, my colleagues are here for you. You can also use the chat for that. And without further ado, I would now like to open the floor for the first of the welcome addresses and pass on the microphone to Dr. Christine Falkengrosser, who is head of section at the Federal Ministry for Energy and uh, sorry, Economic Affairs and Climate Action. Please, over to you. Thank you very much, Geraldine, and thank you very much for everybody uh, to join this uh, room here. I can still see that people are joining and, and still coming in, and then it's great to see such a um, illustrious group from uh, all over the world here. Um, I've, been, uh, I've been asked to jump in for Mrs. Frank because Mrs. Frank did have to uh, follow to a crisis meeting with the minister, so uh, it's lucky for me because now I can be here and welcome you on her um, behalf. I'm the head of section for bilateral energy cooperation and in my section together with uh, Ellen Fitzitzewitz, whom you know well, uh, we are heading uh, the, the um, initiatives for um, women in energy and this is also part of, uh, of this group. So uh, to the official welcome, dear Mrs. Uh, Ingrid Gabriela Hofen, uh, it's very nice that you are here and, and dear Mrs. Simone Peter and also Christina Lind. Christina, it's very nice to see you as well. Geraldine, very nice to have you here and everybody else also very warm welcome from my side. It's a great pleasure to have you here. It's a BETD side event. It's a woman, uh, energized woman uh, event series and it's a special BETD session that we are having here as uh, one of the first sessions that we have in the context of the BETD in these, uh, this year. Uh, we have a, um, the Women Energize Women series is a campaign which is implemented by GIZ and together with BEE uh, in the scope of our energy partnerships that I've already mentioned, which are now the energy and climate partnerships actually from our ministry um, here. Uh, our new government, you are aware that we have elections, have had elections in September last year and we have a new government and the new government supports as a very a uh, high priority also gender equality, not only in energy, but also in uh, energy. This has been anchored in the coalition agreement and in various federal ministries. Uh, we underline our political commitment uh, to have this gender equality uh, and justice as an issue. Um, gender equality is also one of the main policy priorities of our um, presidency in the context of the G7 uh, this year, which is this year in 2022. Since uh, gender equality forms the basis of an equal society and is a key value of the G7, uh, open, inclusive and democratic societies, Germany keeps uh, on advancing equality between women, men and non-binary people globally and works to ensure that all people enjoy equal opportunities around the world. Let us have a closer look at uh, what is happening in the energy sector 
which is unfortunately still continued to be male dominated. The absence of uh, gender equality can be absorbed in both industrialized and also in emerging and developing countries. According to the IRENA study, uh, renewable energy agenda perspective, most of you probably uh, know that one, the renewable energy sector still employs only 32% women. That is more than the 22% of the oil and gas sector, but still there's uh, quite a lot of room for improvement since the share of the employment of share women in the overall employment, non-employment falls to 40 to 50 percent depending on which sector you're looking at in most OECD countries. We do have evidence that companies and society with diverse leaderships have a better opportunity to thrive. They're better prepared to survive financial shock, which we've seen in the past. They have improved profitability and between 34 and 69 percent higher profits, uh, which is proven. They are subject to increased innovation, investment in R&D and the use of talent. They have higher returns and due to decreased risk of and uh, overconfidence. They show increased actions uh, on environmental issues, more awareness there, and they often have more stringent carbonization, decarbonization policies. Uh, we at the Ministry for Economic Affairs and Climate Action, we are convinced that gender equality and especially the women's empowerment are key determinants for advancing a just global energy transition. And this is why we in our section here, uh, we've been supporting uh, with our partners, GIZ, BEE, DINA and, uh, and GWNet, of course, um, various gender related measures, including a global mentoring program, networking meetings and specific skill developments. And, just let me emphasize that it's not only BMW UK, but as I said before, it's the whole German government supporting these activities. So we are also witnessing other ministries doing uh, similar activities. However, um, here at the BMW UK with this uh, initiative that we are heading right here, uh, our goal is to increase the visibility of women in the energy sector. This is very important to also develop the inspiring role models that we have. And we, many of uh, you here in the room are the inspiring role models that we are looking at. And to help to help to develop the skills, which is also part of the networking that is um, part of this scheme to see what can be done and what can we do to pursue our goals. We are happy to uh, also support the first woman energized woman communication campaign to connect, mobilize, and inspire energy women all over the world. With the BEE, again, GIZ, DINA, led campaign we have reached since November 2021, at least 1. 1. million people worldwide. On the 12th of May, we will also organize, in partnership with the GIZ and BEE, the first Women Energize Women Conference at the Smarta E, Europe Fair in, in Munich. This uh, one-day conference uh, will deal with the pressing energy transition issues, which are now more prominent than ever across the world by looking at them from a female perspective and also actively involving female change makers. It facilitates professional networks and mentoring opportunities for women in the energy transition. And we warmly invite you all to attend the conference. Also, we have uh, been supporting our mentoring program uh, and some of you know the program from inside, I think. And we have an outline course, an online course for more than 100 women in 15 countries to empower women in the energy sector and increase the female representation at managerial and decision making levels, implementing by the Global Women's Energy Network uh, in Energy Transition by the GWNet. In partnership again with the GIZ and Dina, who help us a lot in this context. This is why we are establishing the networks and further gender related measures on the local and regional level through our bilateral energy partnerships where the topic of gender equality is always a woman, very prominent one. We believe that empowering women in the clean energy sector is crucial for this success. As I said, globally, we have about 12 million people working in the renewable energy sector today. This figure is supposed to rise 42 to 42 million in 2050. Attracting and retaining the best female and male talents in this sector is key to ensure a successful and speedy energy transition. 
I can see that we are making progress. We all can see that. Uh, we see it here in the room, but we can also see it in many other events and, and opportunities. But it's still not fast enough. We want to be more and we want to be faster. This is why our engagement and our determination, all of our determination is so important. The BMW K seeks to support your efforts with its Women Energize Women event series. I said, I invite you to the international conference, Women Energize Women at the Smarter E trade fair. As I just mentioned, it's on the 12th of May in Munich. I would finally uh, thank my team, especially Anne von Sitzewitz, who's driving with all force uh, in this cooperation and this initiative forward. Uh, thank you for that, Anne. And also the GIZ and the DINA colleagues who are always uh, very supportive in this program ever since 19, uh, <laughs> no, 2019. So I'm very happy to open this dialogue. I wish it's a very fruitful discussion. I'm sure we will have one, as is always the case in this kind of round. Uh, and I'm looking forward to this. Thank you very much. Let us all make the change together. Thank you so much, Christine, for those wonderful words of welcome and hoping this is not out of place. Also, a thank you from my side to you, as with every one of the Women Energize Women events that I get to host, it becomes so clear to me how important the spaces that you're creating and these networks that you're supporting, how meaningful they are to our, us in the learnings that we take from them and, and also our partners. So thank you for that. And I'd now like to give the floor to Ingrid Gabriele Hofen, who is the board member of the Deutsche Gesellschaft für Internationale Zusammenarbeit for the next welcome address. Please, Ingrid, over to you. Thank you so much, Geraldine. Dear Mrs. Falkenbrosser, dear Simone Peter, dear Christine Linz, um, and of course, um, thank you, Geraldine, for, uh, for your kind words of introduction. Of course, dear panelists and energy colleagues um, around the world, who are joining us today um, online. The annual um, Berlin Energy Transition Dialogue is always a perfect opportunity for high-level policymakers, for the industry, for science, civil society, to come together and really to share new experiences, ideas on a safe and actually just energy transition, and also to reflect the bound forthcoming challenges, and there are so many right now. Um, but it is also a very perfect framework for this event, Women Energize Women, for this campaign, in which we are, as we are said, happy to implement together with the BEE, Bundesverband für Erneuerbare Energien, on behalf of the Federal Ministry for Economic Affairs and Climate Action. And it's also my great pleasure to welcome you on behalf of GRZ to wear this inspiring BETD edition of the Women Energize Women campaign. The campaign is a very transition. It's about strengthening the position of women in the energy sector. It's about also making their important role more visible and to give women a bigger say in in a way that actually more people can benefit and that it's really a transition that is just and climate neutral at the same time. With the feminist I'm afraid we're having a few connection issues here. Um, I'm so sorry, Ingrid, if you can hear us. Unfortunately, we've lost connection to you. Mm, are I you hope, back? Can you hear me again? Now you're oh, back sorry. with us. Yes, no worries. Yeah, sorry for this interruption. So we're just explaining the importance of the new orientation by the federal government on the feminist front development policy. So the focus of this new approach is on strengthening the rights the representation and the resources of women and girls, the so-called 3R approach. And the feminist policy takes a very critical perspective on development, challenges existing power relations in societies and economies, and prioritizes gender equality, human rights, and diversity in policymaking. A feminist forum and development policy also entails dismantling discriminatory social norms, stereotypes, 
hampering the self-determination and development of women and girls. And this becomes particularly important in sectors mistakenly considered to be a male domain, which is unfortunately in part still true for the energy sector in many countries worldwide, including in Germany, as Mrs. Falkenwasser just laid out in her introductory remarks. Women make half of the population. They also make half of our future, actually. And there are the drivers for innovation. They are technical experts on many fronts. They are consumers with their own vicious ambitions. And of course, they can become so strong political allies when it comes to renewable energy, because they can really see how renewable energy make a difference in every day's life. But still, this huge potential which is embedded in, in women is not fully leveraged. And women continue to face barriers to equally engage in the sector. And therefore, the promotion of gender equality and the elimination of gender-based disadvantages and discrimination continues to be the two strong pillars of GIZ's corporate value system our strategy and our policy orientation. We strongly believe that we need to live and walk the talk within our own company and together with our partners, our commission partners, the ministries, international organization, in order to facilitate the change and impact on the ground. We are happy to say that now um, across the company approximately 46% of the leadership and management positions in our company are occupied by women. And in Germany, it's even a bit higher and reaches 53%. GIZ, which is active in more than 120 countries, counts on more than 24,000 employees worldwide. And we promote gender equality mainly through gender mainstreaming approaches but also through the specific promotion of women's rights and the fight against gender-based discrimination and violence, especially in conflict-prone countries. The ongoing global energy transition offers a wide range of opportunities to utilize the talents of women to unlearn existing stereotypes, you have to unlearn it, and to shape new ways of designing the production distribution of energy systems for the future. We are so happy to see an increasing number of impressive initiatives, role models and networks on women empowerment and gender mainstreaming and in the energy sector, especially in the climate and energy partnership countries, numerous initiatives on gender mainstreaming have been implemented and many of the drivers behind these promising developments are in the room today. And I'm so happy to get to know you a bit, bit more this afternoon. I know that we together, we can close the gender gap and make a gender just, a gender equitable energy transition a reality for all of us. So let's do it. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Ingrid. I think that was a very inspirational opening to our event. And I'm so excited personally that we are moving, hopefully transitioning into this era of feminist foreign policy, as you outlined in your welcome address. And last but not least, I would now like to pass the microphone to Simona Peter, who is the president of the German Renewable Energy Federation. Simona, over to you, please. Yeah, thank you very much, dear Christine, dear Ingrid, dear Ellen, dear Geraldine, dear colleagues and uh, dear ladies. Um, personally and in my capacity, uh, capacity as a president of the German Renewable Energy Federation and as one of the organizers of the Berlin Energy Transition Dialogue and implementer of the Women Energize a Woman online campaign. It's my great pleasure to welcome you to the official BTD Woman Energize Woman event. Until today, the energy transition does not only lack political prioritization in a lot of countries and the needed strong and supportive framework conditions, but also gender or general diversity still is widely missing. But all talents must be included in order to drive innovation and to push the global energy transition. In short, more women are needed for efficient environmental protection and 
an ambitious and just energy system transformation. The share of women in the energy sector has always been very low, too low, and even more so at the top of the corporate sector. This is not surprising since women are also underrepresented in almost all other sectors of the economy, especially at the higher management at sea level. In the energy transition, oh, sorry, if the energy transition is to progress, the right approach is needed and this must uh, be based on gender justice uh, in the energy sector. To achieve this, women must be perceived with all their qualifications, capacities and abilities, irrespective of their potential future life plans, as is the case today with regards to men. Women are competent leaders who bring technical understanding to the table while at the same time being oriented towards the common good and providing social competencies and empathy and aiming to creative solutions. It is time for better and more enabling framework conditions to finally not only talk about but uh, actually guarantee equal rights, equal income and equal career opportunities. It is true, the share of the share of women is also low in the renewable energy sector, but according to a PVC study, the growth is significantly higher than in the conventional in the fossil and nuclear energy industry sector. So the renewable energy sector is more progressive in this question. The future de development and the necessary strong growth of the renewable energy sector will depend to a large extent on women from all disciplines working together to promote, facilitate and implement the energy revolution. Structures like Global Women's Network for the Energy Transition or the Women of New Energies, of which I feel very honored to have accepted the patronage in Germany. These networks are clear signals and the proof that women of the industry need and inclusively have a strong voice and the mutual encouragement and support is a core factor for gender equality also in the renewable energy sector. It is time for pioneering women to raise the visibility of women in the energy sector and to lead by example. There's a need for these uh, impressive women and girls all over the world to show that women have a voice, that women can and must play a central role in advancing the energy revolution and sustainable economy, economy, sorry, economic models in general for acceptance and active support for renewable energies and for climate protection and for the preservation of our great planet. Thank you very much for your attention and I wish you all a great and rewarding day and a, a great conference. Thank you very much. Thank you so much to you, Simona, and another big thanks to all three welcome address speakers and the organizations, of course, enabling all of this. And now I would like to transition into panel mode and introduce our valued speakers to you. Please excuse the brevity of the introduction at this point because we're glad to have many fabulous speakers here for you today. Maybe you can give a little bit of a wave into the camera as I'm introducing you so our audience knows who's who as well to say hello. So uh, first of all, I would like to very warmly welcome Punky Mayola, who is the senior engineer of the city of Akurulini in South Africa, and also the former chair of the Association of Municipal Electric Units and Women in Electricity. Welcome very much to this discussion. I would also, I'd also like hi. to warmly welcome, hi, hi Punky. <laughs> I'd also like to warmly welcome Ruba Alsubi, who is the co-founder of Together for Energy and the Climate Society, and um, yes, and a green economy strategist and advisor with much experience in the policy sector. Great to meet you, Ruba. Hello, hello, everyone. I'm warmly welcoming Rana Fakihi, who from Women and Clean Energy from Saudi Arabia. Hello, everyone. Happy to join this panel. Great to meet you, Rana. Thank you so much for being part of this. Also, a warm welcome to Tania Sauma, the Chief of Staff of the Chilean Secretariat of Energy from Chile. Hello. Hola a todos. Hola. 
Um, also warmly welcoming Kathleen Schneider, the co-founder and coordinator of the Brazilian Women's Network in Solar Energy from Brazil. I know she's here, I saw her earlier. <laughs> um, and uh, yes, last but not least, I am so happy to welcome Natalia Slobodian, the head of the Department of Climate Change and Environmental Protection from the Ukraine. So I would love to begin with you, Natalia, and of course, a question that's sort of pressing on everybody's mind, which is, we hope that networks such as these women's networks can support each other also in times of crisis. But maybe you can outline for us how you feel we could support you in any way during during this terrible war. Yeah. Um, um. First of all, greetings to all participants. I, I'm grateful for the opportunity to take part in this important global event. Well, my name is Natalia Slobodian. I am the head of Department of Climate Change and, and Environmental Protection, uh, the energy company of DTEC. First of all, I'd like to say a few words about DTEC. DTEC Group is the largest private investor in Ukraine's energy industry. Our enterprises produce electricity at solar, wind, and thermal power plants, mine coal and natural gas, trade energy resources on the Ukrainian and foreign markets, distribution and supply electricity to consumers. Actually, the tech group employees uh, are more than 55,000 people. Um, 18,000 of them are women. Um, Colleagues, I am sure that today um, there will be many speeches and discussions that relate to gender equality, women's leadership, women's right to equal pay, right to build a career on the equal footing with men and many, many other really important issues. But in times of peace, unfortunately, today Ukraine and all its women live in conditions of a full-scale war unleashed by Russia. Therefore, for tens of millions of Ukrainian women these days, completely different rights are the highest priority. The right to have a child alive, not killed by a Russian missile. The right to have a living husband, not killed by Russian bullets. The right to have living not buried under the rubble of houses destroyed by Russian bombs. And overall, the fundamental right for a uh, woman to be alive. I'm not even talking about the right to live in a peaceful, free Ukraine, which hasn't been captured by, by the enraged uh, dictator Putin. The main thing that Ukrainian women want now is to survive and for their families to survive as well. Uh, as, of, um, as of March 23rd, the Office of the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights um, registered uh, 2,571 civilian casualties in Ukraine, 977 killed and 1,594 injured. Among those killed were 143 kids for now, for, for current day. There were also casualties among detail group employees. Nine of our colleagues have been killed and 10 more have been, in, have been injured. In addition, according to the United Nations statistics, the number of people who fled Ukraine due to Russian's large-scale invasion has reached up to 4 million, and 90% are women and children. Another six, uh, more than 6 million became internally displaced persons. I am uh, one of these internally displaced persons. Just imagine, during the current 30 days, it's my third place of location. Moreover, 13 million people are stuck in war zones. They cannot live from there. Our women are our heroes. They give birth in air raid shelters. 
they lead children without panic every day to shelter during air raids and come up with various entertainment game, games to save the children um, psychic health from the horrors of war. This is our priority for now day. Today, all Ukrainian women have become defenders of their land. And each of us makes our contribution to the common victory. Some in the armed forces of Ukraine, some as a volunteer, some continue doing usual, but now so important work in hospital, pharmacies, shops, various companies. Unfortunately, I have had a big news for, for all for all global audience. On March 4th, the whole world watched it as the Russian army attacked the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant, the largest nuclear facility in Europe. It was only by a miracle that Russian shells did not hit the reactors and, and the storage facility for used nuclear fuel. Mankind survived Chernobyl survived Fukushima, and now Russia is trying to, to arrange another mankind disaster for the whole world, but on a much larger scale. We call on Western countries, NATO and the United Nations to immediately impose no-fly zones over all Ukrainian nuclear power plants. It saves us. This issue has long gone beyond the security of Ukraine. The fate of hundreds of millions of lives are at stake. Today, Ukraine and its people protect not only themselves. We, we are defending the all civilized world. We are defending basic international principle, principles such as freedom, democracy. We need the help of the international community. We declare with full confidence that Russian aggression against Ukraine continues to be supported only by the calculation of saving extra profits from the sale of hydrocarbons. The current record prices for oil and gas strengthen the aggressor's confidence in the availability of money for new cruise missiles against Ukrainian cities uh, and peoples. Leading countries of the world have begun consultation on, on um, an embargo on the purchase of Russian oil and gas as well. On behalf of 250,000 energy workers, gas workers and miners, we ask you to protect the, the lives of our children and impose an absolute embargo of Russian oil and gas. We are, con we are convinced that this is the only way to force Russia to stop the war, to stop the killing of civilian kids, the destruction of our houses, schools, hospitals. Dear colleagues, maybe my speech was very emotional, but uh, perhaps my speech did not so, so quite correspond to the to the general theme of the event, but now I'm speaking as a mother, as a wife, as a staff of energy company, as a citizen of Ukraine. Sorry, I could not do otherwise. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much for being here with us and for speaking those words, Natalia. I'm sure that if we had a a physical setting there would be a standing ovation right now for your incredible speech and the strength that you're showing in this situation i'm also finding it hard not to become emotional um and it brings, I, I will be very uh, happy to share my experience our project our success story because um the gender equality is my values i strongly believe in this is part of my life but now i can't speak about um, about these issues the priority to save my life it to save life of mine to kids it's a, it's the first task for nowadays for me Absolutely, of course it is. And I think that's also painfully become apparent, of course, although we should have known this prior to this war, the correlation between our um, uh, renewable energy efforts and peacekeeping in this world and the correlation between having, yes, freedom of energy, let's say, and, and freedom as such. 
So I think it's very important that you, yes, like you said, spoke to what's most important now. Thank you. Um, and I would very much like to take it to heart, as you said, how can we support you? We can lobby our governments to do the right thing. And we can also all lead by example, which is to be energy conscious consumers, to do our best to, um, yeah, to contribute to a situation where it's possible for our countries to no longer consume Russian energy sources and, and to, yeah, support you in that way. I would be very happy to see if there are other things that we can do to show our solidarity and to support you and would also welcome anybody in the room to share ideas if they would like to. Um, and please obviously feel free to come back into the conversation at any point where you feel this is also something you want to speak on. I will continue the round. Obviously, um, um, yes, uh, to, to, to dig a bit deeper now into the topic of how our global forms of support to each other can be expanded in the renewable energy sector. And I would like to move all the way from the Ukraine over to Chile and come to you, Tania, because Chile has been such a global leader also when it comes to the field of renewable energies and really setting a different pace for other countries to follow. Um, and I believe that you and your colleagues have been doing this also with a very broad view in mind of how you feel um, development, social justice and energy justice are all interconnected. So perhaps you can share a little bit the efforts of the Chilean government in this regard and, um, and how you're supporting gender mainstreaming efforts across the country through your, through your work in the government. Thank you, Geraldine. I think it's very difficult to speak after Natalia, especially in an event like this where the focus is somewhere else, but also I think for all the feminists in the world, an effort for, for peacekeeping has to be made, has to be a priority, because women and girls suffer the most during war times. I, I, I want to begin with that and, and to say to Natalia that our heart is with you before continuing because I, I don't think it's fair that I carry on talking about statistics um, when something like this is happening and Natalia is here sitting with us. Um, the Chilean Ministry of Energy has a program called Energia Mas Mujer, so that would be Energy Plus Women, which is, it's a voluntary program between um, our ministry and the private enterprises. And we have 40 different actions that the companies can take on um, to improve gender equality in the sector. So what they can do is that they come to us and we run a study and, and a diagnose on, on what is the situation of women in the company so for instance, what is the um, salary difference between men and women? What is the percentage of women in your uh, directory? Um, what are the conditions? Do you have protocols against gender violence in the workplace? And all of that. So it's a very integral program. And we ask them to start where they are doing the worst. So for instance, if they have one woman sitting in the boardroom, we ask them to uh, create a quota for women in the boardroom. If they don't have a protocol against violence in the workplace, then we'll ask them to go ahead and create that protocol and we will do it along with them. So it's not, it's not a punishment and it's not, it is a voluntary program. So they could start somewhere else, even though we would very strongly recommend them to start in a, in a specific place. But what they do is that they go ticking boxes. So they would start, for instance, if they don't have any women leader in the company, they could start creating an instrument, a program of uh, training leader women. And then we will ask them to create a leadership uh, for female promotion in the company, because otherwise they could just do this little course and nothing would change. So it's... 
it's a very complete program. And I think it has only three years and is showing great advancements in gender mainstreaming in the private sector. By the other hand, in the public sector, what we're doing right now is that we have created a gender and human rights unit here in the Ministry of Energy in order to have a broad gender and human rights look into every energy project that we are looking into. For instance, when we look at the issue with wood in Chile, in the south of Chile, the south of Chile is very cold. You might think that because we are in South America, it's like a tropical country, but it is not. The south of Chile is Patagonia, so it's extremely cold and people have to warm themselves up. And the main energy source they have is wood and they use it for cooking, but actually, when we are looking what we can do about wood, we have to look at the situation of women, because men would go out to work, women would remain in the houses, and women would breathe all the contamination of cooking with wood and heating themselves with wood, women and children specifically. So when we are thinking on a policy to uh, improve the, the conditions, their conditions inside of the houses, we have to think first in the women. So I think gender mainstreaming has to be done also in every public policy you are doing and thinking how this policy is going to affect women in particular. And that is what we are doing here right now. Thank you. I think there's a lot of inspiration really to be taken from your work. I've had the pleasure of being in conversation with some of your colleagues in previous sessions. Um, and yeah, and I think it's, like I said, a very uh, great dynamic that you're bringing forth that is setting a pace that other countries can perhaps take some lessons learned from. And with that, I'd like to move into the into the Middle East and pass it over to Ruba. I, I read that you were the first policy director at the Ministry of Environment and um, in Jordan. And so I thought it might be a good transition from Tania to share a little bit of the situation of what's happening there on a policy sector. But do please also combine it with sharing with us what Together for Energy and the Climate Society is, is up to. Thanks, thanks, Geraldine. Hello again, everyone. Uh, Natalia, we uh, we all uh, were heavily influenced by your uh, your speech and your emotions. Uh, uh, women, if anything, they are uh, builders of bridges and uh, peacekeepers by nature. So uh, I hope that we can all uh, join uh, in, in solidarity for all those who suffer around the world. Hope our peace uh, comes uh, soon. Um, well, Jordan, yes. Um, so I, I am an environmentalist um, to start with, and uh, uh, I was the first policy director at the Ministry of Environment, the first female director and the youngest one. So you can imagine uh, the learning experience that I, uh, I gained uh, uh, through going uh, through that. But um, uh, honestly, it has taught me uh, the value of um, uh, men supporting women and women uh, energizing women. Uh, so uh, this is a campaign that is much needed. It has to be sustained all around the, the globe uh, at all times. And uh, that this is one of the reasons why I also co-founded and supported uh, a few other young um, female engineers from Jordan to establish together for energy and climate society uh, in an attempt to give back uh, those who really benefited from mentorship and from women's support wanted to benefit others wanted this to to uh, uh, to have a widespread uh, across the governorates of Jordan, so outside the capital Amman. Um, and uh, hopefully with the, with the generous support from uh, GIZ, the uh, Jordanian German Energy Partnership, that we'll be able to uh, start our uh, activities uh, soon. Um, back to the to the women's situation, gender in Jordan. Uh, I don't know if you know, but Jordan has uh, the highest engineers per capita in the world. We have an engineer for every 40 people in Jordan, and around 26% of those are women. Uh, however, um, uh, when it comes to labor market, women um, uh, sh women's share is uh, less than 15% uh, across sectors. And uh, even uh, during 2021, the unemployment rate, of course, went high. Uh, the average is 25% and women's share is 33%. Uh, so we have a lot of amazing 
women, potential um, engineer scientists, but across uh, specialties. And unfortunately, this is not fully uh, utilized or contributing to the Jordanian economic development. Um, and the energy sector in Jordan embarked into uh, a successful journey of uh, energy transition to renewable energy in 2013, after our uh, uh, law for uh, renewable energy and energy efficiency was issued. And in 2016, um, this uh, made 16% of the workforce in the clean energy sector uh, goes to females. And uh, that, I think, was a sort of a golden era because um, uh, since 2018, we have been facing a lot of ups and downs in the renewable energy sector development, and this has definitely impacted the female participation. Nevertheless, these figures are for formal employment. Uh, when it comes to women acting on the ground, uh, community-based initiatives, social enterprises, NGOs, uh, I'm sure that the number is much higher. Most of the environmental NGOs, NGOs working on climate action, uh, civil society participation in various uh, clean energy, renewable energy, energy efficiency uh, projects uh, mostly are women. Uh, however, you don't see them uh, in, in uh, top management positions and you don't see enough of them on boards, boards of directors. And I think um, um, I, this would need a lot of enablers. The government can do a lot. And of course, I'm also happy to hear that Chilean experience in terms of having a department within the Ministry of Energy uh, for for uh, gender and human rights. It's an interesting experience that I'd love to learn more about. But currently, I think GIZ is also conducting a gender uh, mainstreaming uh, mapping, uh, as well as a roadmap for Jordan to uh, increase the women uh, in the energy sector, but also in decision-making role. Um, so I, I believe from a personal experience that there's a lot that civil society networks, uh, mentorship programs can do. Uh, we have already uh, contacted GW Network conversation to uh, to discuss potential collaboration. Uh, some Jordanian women uh, graduated from the mentorship program recently with G GW Net. And this is much appreciated because we need more of this. And I'm sure that every single woman who benefited from such programs will give back, will go and try to inspire others, try to influence uh, someone's life. So. Um, I really look forward to hearing more about the best practices in other parts of the of the countries, uh, and hopefully uh, we can somehow uh, have a global uh, network for for women in energy. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Ruba. I think you raised a lot of uh, really interesting points that hopefully we can get back to in the course of discussion and also perhaps dig a dip, bit deeper on like what kind of networks, like what would be most effective and valuable? Because I thought it's quite interesting that you have this sort of multidisciplinary approach at T4EC and would be interesting to learn, are there like policy specific networks? Are there research specific networks? And where does it make sense to link those in together in an interdisciplinary manner. Also a really good point I was going to make in the beginning is that we're obviously welcoming also all men in this room as we need this to be a, a joint <laughs> um, struggle that we hopefully will turn into joint impact and results. So thanks for making that point. Um, I'd like to transition to South Africa, um, to Punki, and pay, take a, along this point that Ruba made, how hard it can be to break this glass ceiling. Like even if you're building up more skill sets around women and, and educating women and theoretically sort of opening, there's still this glass ceiling that we hit when we come to a management level. So perhaps you can share how that relates to your work on a municipal level, but also generally in South Africa, Punky, and also share with us a little bit more about what women in electricity has been doing, please. Um, uh, thank you so much, Robin. Um, good afternoon to the panelists and all the attendees. Uh, Natalia, our heart goes out to you from South Africa. Uh, to the Ukrainian uh, uh, country as a whole. Uh, from my side, I am the previous chairperson of the Amalgamated Municipality Workers, but uh, women in electricity. So what we are looking at is to look at the women within the electricity sector, because we have seen that the progression of women into decision-making position was very, very slow. So within the, the municipalities, we, we formed an organization where women look at how can we mentorship women throughout 
the municipalities in South Africa and the utilities, you know, to be able to hold each other's hand and to say how do we work together with men in the gender mainstreaming, because gender mainstreaming, both parties must be involved. It cannot just be women, but we expect men to hold our hands and be able to assist and train those ladies that are coming up uh, in the technical field. So what, what has happened in South Africa, I must say there has, there has been so much that has been happening from the government. Uh, the, the energy sector, the Department of Mineral Resources and Energy has launched an, an advisory council that looks at energy issues. So this advisory council, uh, it's got 90% of women that looks at energy issues within uh, the energy sector. So what they do, they will report yearly to the minister in terms of uh, what is the progress in terms of projects and if these projects within the energy sector are they, uh, is the first priority given to women in terms of projects and challenges that women are facing because women are facing a lot of funding challenges and the technology challenges. So this advisory, advisory committee is there to assist the women entering the energy sector and report in progress and what is happening from the, uh, the private sector side as well in the energy sector. But we have seen that, that there's quite a few, there's a lot of barriers that women are going through. I mean, you look at infrastructure alone. I have, we have ladies that are more technicians that have to go work in, in substation ways in, in the rural places. And in infrastructure, there are no bathrooms uh, next to where they're working. They have to, you have to drive about 30 minutes to get your latest bathroom. So you can imagine if you are a lady, you are on your period, you are working on site. Uh, in the middle of nowhere, wind farms are being uh, uh, installed. You are in a project on a wind farm, you are on your period. I mean, you have to drive 40 minutes in to get to the nearest um, uh, bathroom. So these are the infrastructure issues that we are, we are still um, going, we are, we are going through issues like that. So how do we ensure that we give women infrastructure? How to assist women that those that have come back from pregnancy, at least you give them work that will be closer to home whilst they are still nursing the baby, at least for six months. I mean, these are the issues we are trying to put to say, can policies please look into that, to say, how do we make sure that women within the energy sector will retain them? Because as soon as they get such hurdles and uh, issues like when I come back, I have to go work, and then they start leaving the industry slowly. And we see that a pool of women start leaving the energy sector because it's not conducive to them. So these are the issues that we are trying to put in policies to say, can the policy uh, from government side, can government look into policies that will be able to assist women in issues where there is um, uh, 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 issues around infrastructure, issues around uh, work-wise and, and sexual abuse. I mean, we are experiencing a lot of sexual harassment in the industry where women have to work at night with men and it's just the two of them. And the man is a supervisor when they come back to report such issues, uh, it will, the man's word will be taken against the woman's word. And we want them to work at night to understand how it is like to work in the energy sector. So these are the class, uh, the, the, the issues that we are faced with and um, that we are trying to say as women, how do we get mentorship programs to mentor each other and make sure that we give each other advice to say there is a sexual harassment policy in place from government and this is how it works. Ensure that we give them proper uh, documentation to understand what must happen uh, as women in the, in the electricity field. So these are some of the feelings that we are, uh, we are trying to break. And we do have women who are managers, but they are not in decision-making position because it is important as a woman to be in a decision-making position because for you to decide if a woman goes, like um, Rubale said to say, you have to go and fetch wood. I mean, if you have to go fetch wood, you must be part of the policy to say, I can't be fetching wood and my grandchildren are still fetching wood. Where do we draw the line? How do we ensure that at one point we are off using wood? We are now going into the energy mix. So we still have some of the men that are dominating these policies. But some of the NGOs, like our NGO, is to ensure that we set in the policy making decisions to assist and ensure that the women's voice is heard. Wow, thank you. Um, 
Uh, I've just I just took some notes because I think there's already such a wealth of different approaches that are being shared when it comes to gender mainstreaming and all the different topics it, it includes. So we've we've just mentioned obviously the policy level and getting the policy frameworks right. We've mentioned education and making sure the skills are there. And now you spoke very importantly also about working conditions and getting the everyday sort of working setting. Um, so that it's equally uptakeable for women and for men. Let's see what other issues will also collect to the list. I think it's also very interesting that we shared some different approaches, how to how to break those barriers, including mentoring, including research and gathering the right knowledge base for our work. So let's also keep collecting those. With that, I'll maybe I'll pass the microphone over to you, Rana. I would be very interested to learn more about your work at Women in Clean Energy in Saudi Arabia, please. Thank you so much, really, for having this opportunity to be among the distinguished panelists from all over the world. It's very hard to talk after Natalia, really. I send my prayers and hopes uh, to, for this uh, war and crisis to be ended soon. And uh, really, the stability of the global has been jeopardized, really, for, for this crisis. So I send my prayers to you. I'll just shed a light on uh, some examples and only just a glimpse, really, of our works towards um, the gender streaming. Uh, we have, you know, in the recent years, Saudi Arabia has really have made significant efforts to uh, to empower the women through a broad range of uh, initiatives within the umbrella of the Vision 2030. Um, we believe that Saudi women are really bringing passion and energy and enthusiasm to, to the workplace uh, in greater numbers than ever. Um, when I first started, and I'll share really my personal experience here, when I first started uh, or joined the ministry in uh, uh, 2018, there were very few females that are working in the uh, ministry. And now the percentage has really increased more than 30%. And now I think we are about 30% if, of which are, are females. And then also today uh, uh, in the ministry, women are being appointed to senior governmental roles and are leading uh, in a leading uh, positions. And, um, Although, like we we are in a very traditionally male oriented and intimidating also sector, however, women really uh, made an effort and uh, um, and they proved that they have uh, the professional and the leadership capabilities for them to lead uh, critical projects. Um, we have launched several initiatives, like for for the women in clean energy. Me and my dear uh, friend, Dr. Malaka Nouri, who is also a mentor, really uh, in the uh, in the program. Uh, we our our objectives is to cultivate all the women within the sector to share our thoughts, ideas, and how can we support each other in a in a daily basis. One of the initiatives that we have launched just recently, like within this month, is Silla. Sila is uh, a, which means connect. It's uh, our aim to cultivate a community with an aura of aspiring uh, prominent uh, female and male who are well educated uh, uh, to share their experiences and how can we advance the energy. Um, I would like also just to shed a light on that the without leadership, without the support of leadership, nothing will happen. And uh, since the, uh, the appointed of the uh, ministry, uh, Minister of Energy, His Royal Highness Princess Abdul Aziz bin Salman, he give a full support for youth and he always make sure that in all public appearance, he give the recognition for all uh, the young leaders for both male and females. And that's uh, very empowering. For us, for today, like in, in one event, he really pointed and named all the female leaders in front of all the, the nation. And that's such a support that I think the, the young leaders uh, really needed. Um, also, what we believe that um, to make the difference, women and, and uh, girls are um, really play a pivotal role and they have a, they are a powerful uh, agent when it comes to climate adaptation and mitigation. So placing them in a leadership and decision-making roles uh, are really effective towards sustainable uh, growth. 
I'll also share one experience that uh, it's always been uh, uh, circulated that for example, in the negotiation, Saudi team and the Co-op 26, for the first time, they see females who very young, under 30 years old, who negotiate such uh, 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 critical topics. And I think in one of the news, they, they mentioned that they are like negotiating with dinosaurs. And that's, uh, and that's such a really powerful thing that, again, the, the minister and the leadership gives um, a full support. Uh, for both male and female reform, effectively. There's a lot of things to be shared, and I uh, I just wanted to just give a glimpse of what we can do. Um, and I look forward really to hear from everyone uh, and their perspective on the best practices. Thank you so much. Wonderful, Rana. Thank you. And yes, I added recognition and and visibility, political leadership to the list of um, tools that are needed for gender mainstreaming. So thank you for sharing those examples. Now, I know um, the one speaker who I've not asked to share a bit more about her work is having some connection issues, but I was told in our little back channel that Kathleen Schneider might be back with us. So I just wanted to check if she is. And I'm here. Great, <laughs> Catherine. Oh, wonderful. Okay, in that case, I would love to give you the floor now to learn more about your work as you're the co-founder of Brazilian Network of Women in Solar Energy. Um, so I'm not quite sure if you caught the rest of the conversation. One point that already came up is what kind of networks do we need? So is it a good idea to have networks that bring together one skill set, like networks of researchers or networks of policymakers? Um, and or is there the same need for the sort of hybrid networks bringing together different kind of skill sets? So maybe you can share with us your insights from the Brazilian Network of Women and Solar Energy and some thoughts on this. Sure, thank you very much. I'm very sorry. I really had some terrible issues with my Wi-Fi, but I think it's all set now. Can you understand me well? Yes, wonderfully. Okay, great. Um, so, yes, we founded the Brazilian uh, Solar Energy Network um, in 2019. And one of the main reasons, um, it was this question that we had about we didn't see other women in leadership positions and, and discussion um, tables and, and events that we're going on the field when we're talking about uh, solar energy sector, right? And I was doing my master's in a research lab and in that research lab, we were in, in a big group of uh, women leading many projects, but when we would go outside the research lab, we didn't see uh, other other women, uh, we, we didn't know any other women in, in the field itself. So our first question was, well, where are these women? We know they might be outside um, and we would like to have some role models because we are all young um, women starting their careers and we didn't have any role model, any reference. I just <laughs> mute myself. Um, yeah, we didn't have any role models role models and references in the field. And uh, so our first move was to connect some of these women and, and hear from them and, and understand their path and the career options that they had. And uh, that's when the, the network started. And when the network, um, when we started organizing the idea of the network, um, our one of the questions that we had was, well, should we make a renewable energy network, like something more wide or something like solar energy sector? And we're like, no, renewable energy is a bit too much. We don't know about all the other, um, all the other technologies, uh, but we we know about the solar energy because that's what we live, the places that we, we the conference that we attend and and, and field, uh, and we didn't know much about the other fields. So we thought, well, let's let's just focus on on solar energy. But we know the energy sector, the 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 gender equality in the energy sector, it's 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 a problem. Like it's it's an issue that. It must be talking in, in, in all those fields, right? And um, well, we are noticing like a lot of changes in the solar sector since the, the network began. And uh, we are also noticing other networks that are coming up since our network came up. Uh, network and, and biogas, these women, they, they notice uh, our activities and they came to talk to us and ask some advice on how to organize a network in their sector. So where I want to... Um, go with all this uh, this points is that um oh 
Catherine, we just lost you there. Oh no, with a cliffhanger. <laughs> um, how unfortunate. Um, hopefully Catherine will be back in a moment to complete the point that she was making. In the meanwhile, I'd like to open the floor with a couple of questions that I would like to pose to the whole panel and then see who wants to pick up. So if all panelists might want to, if you're able with your bandwidth to switch your cameras back on. Um, one question I've been wondering about as we've been in discussion, because it came up a few times is, do we have what we need to do the work we need to do? As in, do we have all the information we need? And if not, do we where do we get it from? Specifically, do you all have the data about how many women are represented in the energy sector and other data sets that might be necessary to do your advocacy work, to do your uh, programming work? And um, if so, can you share <laughs> the positive sort of maybe lessons learned on how you got to these um, data sets or how they're being organized in your country? Or if not, um, where how you would like to see these come together? So yeah, um, what's, Tina, please. Tania, sorry, please. Hi, um, so we have the data because we had a law from I think 2012, I could be wrong, so please uh, don't take my word for this. I think it's 2012 that was supposed to ensure equal payment for women, but what what I, it actually did is that it forced the companies to monitor the difference in the salaries between men and women. So what we have now is that we have the same difference we had 10 years ago, but now we know what difference we have. Um, and we also know what is the participation of women. In our case, in the sector is 23%, so it's still very low. And um, what I think we need now, in our case, that we have the data, it's a different law. Because these voluntary actions we are taking are not working. And um, there are some estimates that if we just wait without doing anything, equal payment could come in 20, I don't know, 200. So we can't wait. We need to pick up the pace and we want to get it by the end of our government. We just started three weeks ago. This is our th third week of government. And I wanted to say a little about that because we are, we have the youngest president in the world. We are a feminist government. And we have a broader set of politics for women in the workplace and for working women in general. So we want to build a national care system that can support women when they go to work. Because if you look at the statistic in 2020, almost 35% of the women were not even looking for work because they had too many care responsibilities. So they couldn't go to work that leaves them in a condition of dependence, in a condition of vulnerability, that we just can't stand for it. So we need to build a national care system because care, it's a really important thing. Care should be a right, and a right not only for children and all the people and, depend and people that is dependent in general, we also have the right to care. So th that's a whole different discussion, but what I wanted to say is that we don't need only to address specifically the energy sector. We need to create broader politics in order to women to access the, the workplace. And this is important because the energy sector in our economy is a growing sector. We don't have that many of those. So if we want to get women into more technical employment that have where they can get higher wages, they should be able to access this particular sector as well. So this is why we are creating the conditions outside the energy sector so the women can come and work here and also inside the energy sector so they can remain inside the energy sector. Because as Punky Majola was saying from, from Africa, from South Africa, in our sector, the lack of infrastructure is also a problem. It is also an issue that women go to work and they don't have a toilet. So we have to create a sector where women are welcome, not only where 
uh, women can access, they, they need to be welcome. Thank you. Um, um, we'd love to hear how that relates to other panelists. And Ruba, you already raised your hand, please. Yes, thank you. Uh, so I think when it comes to data numbers, um, uh, the world has changed a lot, right? Uh, not everything is about uh, formal jobs, formal employment. And uh, there are women who are struggling to enter the market for the first time, youth and fresh grads and so on. But there are women who are also facing difficulty to re-enter the market after the pandemic. Uh, so there are a lot of dynamics that are changing around the world. And uh, data, I think, is still done in the conventional way in most countries. Uh, the general data, even the general one that's available, is not um, analyzed in order to inform planning or uh, decision making. So I think in addition to looking at data availability, categorization, subsectors, because these things really matter when it comes to gender mainstreaming, you have to know the different types of jobs. Uh, the locations, the uh, the employer, the demand side is very important to, to understand. Is it a, a distribution company? Is it an electricity company? Is it a, an ESCO? Um, is it a government entity? So all of these details need to be there in order to inform proper planning and also in order to prepare the supply side, which is the women who are going to enter or re-enter the market. So I think it's the data categorization uh, and then the data analysis in order to inform uh, decision making. Yeah, thank you. And in that context, of course, issues around standardization and interoperability are important on a national level, but also important on a global level if we want to find ways to connect our efforts. Natalia, please. Yes. Okay. Okay. Yes. <laughs> no, it's, no, it's okay. So I, I'd like to stress that gender is one of the top priorities for my company, DTEC. And frankly speaking, since 2013, DTEC has increased the number of women in, in the management position by 20%. Uh, really, it's very nice progress for energy uh, company, especially in, in the Ukrainian landscape. Um, so, uh, if we talk about the equal rules in the salary between men and women, uh, we have no such problem in company. So, it just depends on your skills, your professional expertise, your experience, but it doesn't depend on who are you, women or men. Absolutely. So, and uh, here in Ukraine, we have a very strong non-governmental organization that invest uh, in, in gender equality. One of these organizations is uh, Women Energy Club of Ukraine. Uh, it uh, united around uh, members, uh, a lot of members. Yeah, in business, uh, in really business life, we are a competitors. But as a member of um, Women Energy Club, we are allies and we try to, to support each other. We try to make networking, to, to coach, to advise, etc. It's a very friendly space for women from the different sectors, the different energy sectors, energy companies as well. Great, and congratulations for that also. Um, also interesting to hear about the kind of interaction between company and NGOs on this topic. So thank you for sharing that. Punky, please, you raised your hand. Uh, yes, thank you, thank you. Yes, I'd like to uh, say that uh, our data is more in the conventional way. We, we have different NGOs with their own database and government with their own database. I think what is important is consolidation of all these databases because we end up with all this data all over the place, as Ruba has said, that like it's conventional. We still have a lot of conventional with uh, databases all over. The database is up to date, but uh, no one is sitting to consolidate that uh, to say this is a formal database of the women in energy sector, you would have a database of uh, entrepreneurs on the one side, and then you'd have a database of those that are into the municipality and utilities. So I think what is important is just to consolidate. But I think from, 
from this discussion, we are here to learn how other countries are doing it and, and what are the best practices that we can take back to our country to say this is how the other countries are doing it and how can we do it the best practice so that we just have one consolidated that of thing. Thank you. Yeah, that's a very great point to raise. Uh, Rana, do you want to react directly to that, please? That is one of the fundamental challenges I think many nations are, are facing. But then, what we, but I know that there's ongoing initiatives towards that. Uh, in, in the case of the ministry, for example, we have a whole initiatives that fall under the 2030 vision uh, programs and initiatives that it's, the aim is to enhance the capabilities within the energy sector for both. We talk about both genders here. And the, the, the effort is still ongoing uh, to, uh, to have the correct data. But what I can see from my experience day in on a daily basis working in the ministry, every day there is uh, uh, recruiting of, of uh, females, and not because there are females. As His Royal Highness and the Minister of Energy always say, it's always about the capabilities and the diversities that they bring. It's not about the gender, it's about their backgrounds or what they can bring uh, to the table, and uh, we see it really um, uh, a live example of that every day in every meeting that they 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 have really bring a, a different perspective uh, and, uh, diff and an innovative, I would say, solutions towards uh, the energy uh, project. But then also, I would like to shed a light, if I have time, um, uh, in terms of the educational and universities. The kingdom is. Uh, investing a lot in terms of teaching and training uh, and give them the right tools uh, to perform uh, uh, better. For example, this year, uh, the King, um, one of the uh, um, leading uh, universities, uh, King Fahad uh, Petroleum for Petroleum and Minerals, it was only for male. And it's the, their main, their main uh, studies and topics is uh, on the energy matters. And it's always it's it's been always for males, but now this year with the, the leadership of His Royal Highness, he opened the doors for females, knowing that the engineers uh, of the new generation of engineers, females, they they have to have that chance to be part of the change uh, uh, in a global scale. Uh, for example, also in the case of uh, Effet University, we have a. Uh, it's, it's an only female college, but also they were open the doors for for male, and they just announced it uh, in in I think in a month or so, um, and they they have the opportunity for both genders to uh, uh, to to give them the chance to to uh, study in the, um, renewable energy or more in energy uh, topics. So there is ongoing uh, efforts that the kingdom is doing, um, and it's very interesting, really to be part of that and to witness that. However, with, that, with all the, uh, the efforts that's been going, uh, the journey just yet to start. And we have a long journey towards uh, okay, equal opportunities uh, for both. Thank you, Rana. Um, Ruba, you had raised your hand earlier when we were doing the circle still on the data topic for a second time, right? Maybe, may I pass it back to you? Yeah, uh, I just wanted to mention because uh, Rana just reminded me, I, I was reading uh, some reports recently about uh, why women should be there. It's not not only because of, of numbers, it is also because of the value added that they bring into the table. And one of the things that struck me was, um, first of all, women uh, make 70% of consumption decisions in their, in their household, in their community, in their workplace. So them being part of decision making and planning, especially for resource efficiency, is extremely important. And the other part is that women actually, the startups um, founded by women are 10% more profitable or more financially um, profitable than, than the men-led uh, startups. So you can see that it is not only about, you know, accommodating numbers because uh, of the population issue, but it is really adding value and utilizing uh, some of the competencies, the, the natural competencies that women have in, in different locations. 
Thank you. Thanks for bringing those forth. And I'm sure you all have fantastic examples also from your countries in case anybody else wants to share, you know, why that, I mean, it should be obvious to everyone, but as you pointed out, Ruba, this is not just uh, for the sake of equality. It's also for the sake of impact and for the sake of making more profit and just getting to where we want in a more effective way. Um, yeah. So if you have other examples to share why we are engaging in these efforts of gender mainstreaming, then obviously please feel free to do so. I'm going to open the floor in a minute for questions and comments from our participants. Um, uh, Tania, perhaps you want to share some more success examples from Chile, but I was also going to ask the question to you, like, with, with, like I said before, I feel like you have in many ways, a sort of leadership role with all everything that you've achieved already in the renewable energy sector and gender mainstreaming. How are you sharing what you do? Obviously, in fora like this, and that is great. What other networks exist or what other forums exist where, for instance, you sit together with others working in creating gender mainstreaming units in their ministries? Do, do these Do these kind of networks exist already? Well, <laughs> now that we just started government, we are creating them. Of course, there are national and international networks where women in energy have participated for years, but we also want to create an alliance with women working in other economic ministries. I think that that's my key effort right now, to create a network with the economic uh, ministry with the mining ministry, with the work ministry, in order to create broader policies. That's one thing. And the other thing is that we are working right now in, in a table for the just transition, because the just transition needs to take women into account and needs to create better jobs for women into account. So green energy in that sense, it's it's the key, I think, to create new jobs, to create jobs that are clean for the environment. And in a country like Chile, where women are poorer than men, and I think that's that's true for the rest of the world as well, but I'm just looking to, uh, into Chile. I think the energy sector can provide us a key opportunity to improve the conditions of women as well. So my dream is that we create a pilot project in what we call sacrifice areas in Chile, where we have coal electric centrals where pollute the environment. Uh, they are extremely toxic. People is dying, particularly women are dying because they have a different biology. So it's, it's even harsher for the bodies. And we have a project where we are going to close these centers one by one. And my dream is to create green jobs in those areas because we are going to close these centrals and something needs to happen there. So what needs to happen there is that we have renewable energy in those areas. So areas that have always provided, provided energy for the country now can still do it but without intoxicating the population and with a different um, with a different composition of the work for, of the workforce in those areas. So that's gonna be one of my main efforts now that I'm working in government. Before that, I was working in a women's network in a much broader sense. So it was a feminist collective. And but now what I want to focus on is in creating public policy that can change the lives of women in the country. Uh, and sorry, you asked something about examples. Mm. We have a very successful example in a solar power plant called Cerro Dominador. Cerro Dominador is a concentration power plant and the heliostats were built at, by a workforce that was made uh, with 20% uh, of women, which is not a lot of women if you think about it, but for us was groundbreaking. And what happened there is that the heliostats were better built, they were faster built, and the power plant is working right now, it's in operation. 
So that's a successful example. And we want to create these quotas for um, renewable energy in all the projects we can. Wonderful, thank you. I, I love your uh, vision and I hope we get to see them all come into life in the next years. And yeah, I feel, and this is a generally a question maybe we can dig into a bit deeper now. I'll link it to the question in the chat in a minute. Um, there's so much great work happening and there's so much willingness to network. And yet I feel there are so many dots not yet connected. So I work more in the digital rights uh, area and movement, let's say, and uh, I think there are a lot of interlinkages between digital rights and and the right to uh, yeah energy, renewable energy justice that we spoke about today. And very often when I speak to people, um, I, I know that there are fantastic women like yourselves from the sessions here, but in like my area of work, all these examples are completely unknown. So how do we elevate our voices? How do we become louder in our networks and really, um, yeah, make sure that these these visions that we have, but also the successes we're celebrating are, are heard so that more can join? Also a question to all of you in the panel. Or to put another way, are there any also wishes for how we can, yeah, how we can tell each other stories in a louder way? I'll, I'll just uh, probably volunteer for this one. Um, I think the storytelling uh, and the, the narrative and the and the tools need to uh, be more creative and they need to be also designed and shaped by women. Um, I, I think uh, we know how to reach each other, uh, but I think the narrative and the compelling messages uh, that each of us can convey uh, are not something really, um, uh, let's say, they, they don't, we're not born, all of us, to be communicators and storytellers. So I think uh, we also need to support that that skill in in women, uh, especially those from the engineering and science background, um, uh, to communicate their stories, to share their stories in a, in a more effective and and impactful way. Uh, but secondly, I believe that a knowledge platform uh, for women in energy that where you know where you can go and find examples, find success stories, find, um, for example, I always. Uh, speak about KPIs and that we need to change the way we measure success and the, the way we define success beyond numbers. Uh, so wh who 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 can help me with that? Which country in the world maybe has done something around that? So I think uh, we really need to have that um, uh, open and easy uh, to, to access uh, knowledge exchange platform where we have stories, but we also have examples that could guide us um, uh, not on the academic side, but more on the practical side. Um, uh, these are some of the things that uh, I would personally would love to, to listen to more stories and more examples uh, about. Uh, the second thing, I think we also have a lot of shared uh, issues um, across the border. So it doesn't have to be uh, very country specific or regional specific, but I think there's a lot of common issues that I see all around the globe, the same ones. So what are some of the tips uh, that we could exchange in order to uh, make things uh, better, make things easier, even mentorship? Uh, women from different countries can actually uh, help each other because these are the same issues we face in the workplace. Um, or, or in, in our culture and, and society. So I, I think it is really, where do we find the safe space, the effective tools, um, and then the right skills to uh, to do the storytelling. Uh, digital uh, communication is extremely important. I'm a big fan of that. I'm a blogger myself. Uh, I try to do some of the work that I feel is missing from, from this sector, but I do believe in the power of digital marketing, digital media today, and it's just, you know, as we say, a click away. Anything that you, you need is a click away, but I think these um, skills are, are not very accessible to every woman um, uh, on the globe. I always uh, see uh, privileges in the capitals, in the big cities, uh, while uh, you know maybe an hour drive from the capital, you still see people without 
uh, equal exposure. And if we're talking about equity, we have to start with equal opportunities, equal exposure, equal preparations and readiness, and then we can give them the, the opportunities. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, and maybe some of our colleagues at GI said or some other organizations that could support these efforts are taking notes at this point. Um, because I think um, having, yeah, having these global resources, open source resources that we can point each other to, like a directory, a global directory of all your amazing work, uh, could be a very powerful tool. I want to now open the floor for questions and comments from the participants. Diana, I already saw your comment in the chat, but there's a hand raised by Ine, um from GIZ, and I would now like to open the floor for your question, please. Okay, yeah, it worked. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, from my side, um, I just wanted to make a comment with regards to, to how we can really um, take up this um, discussions in a way that we are able to see change um, as quickly as we all need to. Um, and I think it's important that we take every opportunity to bring up these topics. And there are times we cannot wait for workshops or um, or focus group discussions on these issues, but we have to be entrepreneurial when it comes to our approaches to confront some of the bias or some of the issues. Um, I say this because I, I give an example. I was on a management position um, and I was leaving the position to another duty station. And I remembered I had a team of all women and one man. And um, everyone was saying their bye-bye and saying, okay, it was good working with you or it was not good, what, just giving their inputs. And I noticed, sorry, I noticed that the women were very, very um, clear in terms of focusing on what did I learn from you? What would I be happy to see that you improve on? But then the only man in the group actually waited to speak last, which was one thing I found interesting. And then secondly, emphasized, it's so amazing that you take this new management position in another country, but I would really advise you to take care of your husband and take care of the kids and take care of. And I found it really interesting because no woman mentioned my family situation and it only came from a man. But what did I do? Um, I said, oh, that's interesting. And I took it as a discussion point, even at the farewell meeting. Can we reflect a bit on why no, we, no woman or no lady thought about this from a family perspective and only a man saw that role as just make sure your family is fine. And it led to several interesting discussions, but we had to confront the bias that we have when it comes to issues of gender management and leadership. My point here is for every opportunity that we find, we don't have to wait for workshops or meetings. Once we see an opportunity, we seize it and we discuss about these things. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any comments or reactions to the intervention? If not, then I would pose the next question from the chat. And after that, Nitya, give you the microphone. But we had a question in the chat before we open the floor from Diana, who was adding to the point that Rana raised earlier. Um, she has the feeling that in German institutions, equality, I would like to share, I also share this feeling, equality is often only understood as gender. However, she believes that we need to move toward the framing of diversity in many different senses. Of course, not losing focus on the gender topic, but also in terms of other factors that come into that. So, um, in order to also address other vulnerable groups, other minorities, etc. So her question is, how are your experiences to the panel on this issue? And what what is your, your belief, what are your thoughts on these, starting with gender first or going directly to addressing different diversity factors? Let me maybe reflect a little bit. Um, a very important uh, uh, question. Um, so the diversity is definitely not only about men versus women, and we shouldn't make it sound like that because it might fire back. Actually, it's not a very productive argument. 
um, one of the of the of the things that uh, I've learned uh, is that um, uh, people are resistant to change and to diversity beyond their comfort zone, regardless if it's a man or a woman. Um, of course, women, strong women, um, make them feel uncomfortable, more uncomfortable. Uh, however, it is also for younger people. It is also for people who come from outside the organization, if you wish, and 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 that's. Uh, why being young uh, in a leadership position and a woman can actually magnify um, the resistance, if you wish, or, or the issues in the right place. And that is where I, I believe diversity for, for any sector, whether it's energy or any other sector, for, for any sector or process to be sustainable, it has to have everybody on board. If we uh, exclude any group especially the major, for example, Jordan, two thirds of our population are youth. So you cannot imagine a policy or a strategy made uh, only with people who are above 40 or above 50, uh, while the, the future belongs to two thirds who are not represented in, in the room. So I believe it has to be uh, uh, tackled from different angles. Uh, nevertheless, I, I feel that uh, women are also a, a big constituent. If you look at youth, there are women among the youth community. If you look at vulnerable groups, women are am always among vulnerable groups, the most impacted by climate change, the most impacted by, by uh, the pandemics and, and so on. So I believe women could be maybe an entry point when it comes to tackling diversity, but it is definitely in Jordan, we have refugees, we have uh, people from uh, different governorates, north, south, and different uh, socioeconomic and educational uh, backgrounds. Uh, we have a lot of, of issues to, to tackle when it comes to diversity. However, I think it is a barrier. And once you break the ceiling on one part of the story, then uh, you're able to influence and to inspire others to do the same. But it's an excellent point, definitely. Thank you. Thank you, Ruba. Tania. I also think it's an excellent point. Uh, I think the difference between women and the other, the other, what we in here in Chile we are calling, like, I don't know how to translate this. Maybe special protection groups. Is that women are half of the population? We are not a minority, and I think this is very important. So. I think when we talk about diversity, it needs to be done from an intersectional perspective, but we can't talk about women and treat women as we are a minority because we are not. And, and that's why we have a gender and human rights unit, and it's not only gender and it's not only human rights because there are barriers for women and that's absolutely unfair. It doesn't make any sense. But we also need to think that women's rights are human rights and the discrimination against women, it's a discrimination, it's, it's a violation of human rights. So I think maybe taking a human rights approach can tackle this issue because I, I think the strategies might be different for including more diversity when we talk about only women and we talk about other protected groups. But I think that's important that women, women are not a minority. And, and when we are talking, for instance, in the case of Chile, migrant population, migrants are vulnerable, but migrant women are more vulnerable. So, so we always need to look into that intersection. Yeah, I think that's uh, you explained it perfectly, Tania. Thank you for that. Um, we have two more questions with people raised their hands, and I think we'll be able to just fit those in the time that we have. So, unfortunately, I can't see your full name spelled out, but Melissa, would you like to ask your question next? Uh, hello to everybody. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Um, my name is Milica, and I'm um, the executive director of the National Regulatory Authority in Montenegro currently. Uh, by vocation, I am an engineer, uh, and uh, I would more like to to share the views which actually uh, 
Tania has shared previously with the one good example. So basically, uh, uh, when when you enter into the field of the engineer, um, sometimes wrongly it has been assumed uh, like you are trying to take out something from the man. Um, with the time, uh, it's actually all about the equal opportunities uh, to work in the field of the area that you actually like to do. So uh, one, I think, uh, has posed the question how it can be more visible. I think it's always uh, very good uh, to uh, not to forget and not to hesitate uh, to present good examples of the activities which a woman in the energy sector or in the power sector has been performed uh, in the terms of what society gained from the activity and as well as uh, how uh, the activity has stimulated or unlocked uh, more opportunities for new women in this sector. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for sharing your points there. There's one more hand raised, and that is Matsoha Bungiwe. Would you like to speak next? Hi, yes. Um, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak. My name is Bongiwe Matsuha, um, a policy advisor at Earth Life Africa and South Africa. And my question really pertains to the idea of managing relationships within the sector as you build your um, career. I think the technical aspects is indeed very important, but something that um, I haven't heard um, touched on extensively is the idea of relationship management, especially as women are typically seen to, um, how do I put this, um, to sh or should have a particular style of communication. And as you rise up and take on more leadership positions, it can also, or one can be forced to have a more direct and uh, more stricter form of of communication or leadership. I I could be wrong, but I wanted to try and assess and try and find out from the panel um, what for them has been important in navigating their careers in terms of managing their relationship both with men and women because even the perceptions are different coming from men and women. And I do actually think somebody earlier on who asked this question has already somewhat touched on this to say. Uh, perceptions and how women are viewed in leadership can be different. Thank you very much. Thank you. Rana, yes, please. Thank you so much. Partnership that they established. So that question really comes right to my heart. Do you hear me well? I think only because you were moving, the sound was cutting in and out a bit. So maybe you need to be very okay. still when you answer. <laughs> <laughs> Can you hear me now? It's a little bit in and out, but we can hear you. Okay. If there is one point that I make, it's very important to make. Oh, Rana, I'm so sorry. It's very difficult. We can hear you in between, but it's very, very difficult as you keep cutting in and out. Okay. How about now? I'm so sorry for that. Yeah, yeah this is better. Right? That's better. Yeah. Much better. Thank you. I'm sorry for that. Uh, if there's one point that I make in maintaining and, and having a relationship within the industry, it's very important. It's very vital to maintain a good relationship with all the Starting from the the security in the building to the highest level in the in the organization and that's what i, I learned and uh, i think what made me yeah, um, thank god like made me uh, uh, having this position uh, now also two skills that i always emphasize for everyone male or females diplomacy and locking is very important sometimes raising your vo voice just for the sake of raising your voice would be would, would be held against you rather than making a point. Rather than the bigger point. And then I think you always keep your professional uh, uh, levels and, and uh, you always 
wants to focus in the professional rather than you know the issue of gender or, or, or uh, and it's, I think that's would uh, give also uh, uh, an important or, or the, your colleagues will, will have a perception of you if you are here to work in diplomacy lobbying maintain good relationship in all the sectors are really vital and very important Thank you, Rana. I think we got most of what you were saying. I would love to have another session on, yeah, different perspectives on working cultures and, of course, on all of your career paths. Because I think, as you know, we said, it's so amazing what you have achieved and it would be great to have more time to highlight how you got there. Um, but unfortunately, we won't be able to do that in this session, but hopefully in an upcoming discussion. Punky, you also wanted to comment on this point, please. Uh, <clears throat> yes, yes. No, I wanted to say it is important that uh, because as women, as we are leaders, and when you start uh, being firm in your decision, you are perceived as being emotional. So you need to ensure that you do not back down the decision you make. It is a decision. It shouldn't be seen as that because you are a more woman than you are being emotional. Because as soon as you go up the ladder, you will see, you will get stages where they will be saying, that these, uh, the decision you are making are emotional, and then you start being insecure of what you were saying, and you want to go back, and you're thinking, oh no, maybe I should have, she shouldn't have said it that way. So it's very, very important to be professional at all levels. Uh, professionalism is very, very important. Treat everyone professionally. Uh, do not have favorites if you are, you are at leadership level. Uh, be professional across all. Uh, across the board and what is very important as well as you go up um, management it's, in, it's important to have a mentor someone who will take you through the, the ropes because uh, as young uh, engineers that come through and you get uh, appointed into a managerial position you end up not being sure what uh, what is the correct way but i want just to say mentorship is very very key and as you go up the ladder make sure that you pull another woman up because you are the only hope for her to go up. So it's very important that as women, as soon as you have a position in your department, I it for another woman. You are there to be able to pull other women up. And we need to have that network where we network amongst ourselves and say, how do we assist each other to go up the ladder? If you see another lady in the boardroom struggling and the men are saying, I don't understand what she's saying. You must say, no, no, but you can hear what she's saying. You can see that she is not outspoken so we need to assist and help other ladies coming up but i have seen in boardrooms women uh, you can see that she's still a young engineer she's presenting she can't find a code and people are like oh i've got another meeting be them support them you know be professional be a leader but be supportive to other women as well thank I think that's such an important point, and I couldn't agree more with everything you said. You know, make sure you are the elevator for other people. That is your role as a as a leader. Um, and, and fill your place. You know what I really like about what what uh, she, Pinky just said is that you need to fill that seat that was that you you earned, and you have to to voice uh, your uh, your messages. You have to show that you actually earned this based on uh, merits and not uh, given it because of uh, a quota or anything. So I think yeah. it's very important. Uh, you, we will be judged anyways, uh, ladies, you know that, right? If you're very strong, she's very strong. If you're very soft, she's very soft. But I think what you need to be is professional. And at the same time, don't forget your your empathy um, aside is, is one of your strengths as well. Yeah. And yet, I hope we also get to question and maybe change some of the status quo and some of the norms that have become very sort of male ways of doing business, let's say. Tania, a short word from you, and then I want to pass the floor to Natalia before we close the panel. So very briefly, please. Uh, yes, I don't want to repeat what everyone has said because I agree completely. I just wanted to add a more structural point because um, I think women in leadership need a support system. Women in leadership need other women. So when someone goes, as Macham, I think she said, and said something horrible to you, there are other women in the room that can agree with you and support you. That's, that's one thing. And the other thing is that I think you need somewhere to report. You need in your company, in, in whatever you're working, 
somewhere where you can report sexist behavior. So you are not alone. You don't, it's not only up to you to put a stop to that, because sometimes it can be very awkward and you need to create actual structures, maybe gender sensitivity training for all the men in the company or whatever, but it can be only up to you. That's very unfair. Um, yeah, that was the yeah. only thing I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you very much for adding that point. And now before I pass the floor to the wonderful Christine Lintz from GWNet, I would like to pass the floor back to Natalia before we end with our panel. And I just wanted to give you the opportunity to perhaps once more say how can we support you during this time and what are ways that we can, yeah, we can um, support the work that you're doing. Ah. <laughs> Colleagues, first of all, thank you very much for your very warm words and kind support. I read uh, the meeting chat and uh, I was it was very sensible for me. Yeah, for now, for, for, for now, for all Ukrainians, it's very and very important to, to have no fly zone under the nuclear power plant, because as I mentioned, it it's really will be a tragedy for all mankind. So if we can please uh, speak uh, about this with very loud voice that our government to, to hear us, to hear us as a woman, as a mother, as a wife, because it's about our lives. Thank you. Thank you so much, Natalia. Uh, and a big thank you to you and to all the panelists for the wonderful insights that you share today, for the great work that you're doing and for taking the time to be here with us during the Berlin Energy and Transition Days. And with that, I would now like to pass over the microphone to Christine Linz, who's the Executive Director of the Global Women's Network for the Energy Transition, for some closing words, please. Thank you very much, Geraldine. Uh, good uh, afternoon, uh, ladies, uh, also from my side. Um, thanks a lot, Geraldine, for taking us uh, through these uh, two hours, which passed very quickly. Uh, I would like to uh, really expre express my appreciation to all of you. I think you have touched on uh, many important points. Uh, and, uh, and while uh, you, were, um, you were speaking here, I was just uh, putting things uh, on a slide. I don't know whether the organizers want to project it or whether I should do that, but maybe it's quicker that, uh, that you do that uh, for the sake of time. Uh, basically, uh, what you said, Geraldine, re resonated a lot uh, for me, to me, with me, uh, that it's all about connecting the dots. And I think uh, we at are really uh, committed to do this because it is important uh, to um, to connect uh, all the things out there, and there are a lot of uh, really great um, uh, women and initiatives uh, out there, and uh, and and I think it's uh, it's worth uh, just highlighting those and 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 connecting those all, uh, and, uh, and and I think also what is important uh, is is the fact that uh, it's it's. Uh, it is all about leadership. So on the one hand, we need uh, these initiatives need to be supported uh, from uh, top down, but they are also important to be supported uh, bottom up. Um, we have heard a lot about the importance of data, and uh, it was uh, interesting to see that uh, some of you have already data uh, out there. Uh, it's about women in energy networks. It's about giving back. Uh, I think this is also quite uh, an important topic. It's about networking, but it's also about sharing experience and uh, knowledge. The more open source, uh, the better. Uh, because uh, the challenge that we have ahead of us is, is really big. Um, and uh, when you just think that we currently have about 12 million people in the renewable energy workforce, and this figure is supposed to increase to 42 million by 2050. And currently, with a share of 32% of women, we are far away from uh, equality. And, and this sector is only going to succeed if it manages to attract the best talents of um, women and men. And uh, we know today that uh, this all makes a lot of economic sense because we know that companies with diverse leadership have better economic results. But uh, also important, this is also a human rights uh, issue and uh, it is uh, important 
uh, women have an equal, they are representing half of the population, they have an, uh, the, the opportunity to participate uh, on the employment market uh, with equal uh, rights as, as men do. So all these things are important, but I think uh, what we have to always bear in mind uh, when it comes to these discussions is why are we doing all this? And I think Natalia has uh, has very clearly outlined this. This is about uh, creating energy for peace. And uh, we are not yet there, uh, but I think that will also uh, energize us all to continue uh, in this spirit and uh, to empower women in this field in order to advance the energy transition, uh, in order to uh, hopefully sooner than later have uh, peace on this world and uh, and a sustainable and uh, uh, an environmentally sound uh, and friendly system. With this, I'll hand back to you. Thank you very much. Geraldine, we can't hear you. You are muted. Voila. Classic. <laughs> Even the moderator does it sometimes. So we have come to the end of our event. I have nothing left but to thank all of you and just to point our audience to a couple of upcoming things. We would love for you to share your feedback with us in the questionnaire we've posted in the chat. We would also love for you to follow us in the different social media forum. My colleagues also posted this in the chat. By giving us feedback, we would help us also to make sure we shape future upcoming events to suit your needs and interests. And we have monthly events in the Women Energize Women campaign, which I'm very proud to moderate. So looking forward to the next ones. We also have a conference coming up on the 12th of May. So hopefully a real life opportunity to meet each other in Munich and network and learn more about each other's work. And with that, my colleagues have also just posted that in the chat. I hope to see you at these upcoming events and I hope we get to continue the conversation there. And yes, I very much hope, of course, that there will be peace in the Ukraine soon and that we can meet together under happier circumstances and wish you all much strength and all the best for your work in the next weeks and months. Thank you so much. And thank you to all of you who participated for your wonderful questions and comments.